Okay, so I think we are good to go. It's 5 p.m. in Central Europe and uh, welcome everyone to this new series of uh, online discourse uh, event for early career astronomers that uh, we are organizing within the junior member working group of the IAU. And uh, my name is Camila Danielski. Uh, I work at the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia in Spain and I'm a member of uh, the junior member executive committee. Today, I will be one of your moderator together with Gail. So hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gail Buljan. I'm uh, also a member of the IAU junior member executive committee and uh, I'm working at the Geneva Observatory in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Agnes here for, uh, for her talk. So, uh, we can start, I think, the, uh, the introduction. So, uh, okay, so today we have Agnes Koshpal. Uh, she is an astrophysicist. After obtaining her PhD in Budapest, Hungary, she worked in the Netherlands at Leiden University and at the European Space Agency with the postdoctoral fellowships. In 2014, she returned to her home country in Hungary and won a starting grant for, from uh, the European Research Council in 2016. She is now a tenured research advisor at Konkuli Observatory in Budapest, where she works in the field of star formation. She uh, currently uses the most advanced ground-based and space telescope to study how sun-like stars and their exoplanet systems form. In uh, 2014, she won the Junior Prime Prize in Hungarian Science category, and uh, in 2017, she was also the laureate of the L'Oréal UNESCO International Rising Talents Awards in Paris. Last but not least, for her exceptional results in astronomy in 2018, she received the award of the Roland Etwas Physical Society, and in 2019, the award of the Woman in Science Association. So welcome, Agnes. Uh, we, are, we are very happy to have you here. And uh, uh, I think you can begin your talk and to show us like uh, what you have been doing for the last uh, 10 years or so. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction and also for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to, to be here with you all. And uh, I was thinking uh, hard for weeks what to say. I, I felt a bit out of place, honestly, because I tend to think of, of myself uh, as, as a young astronomer. So what do I have to say to other young astronomers? Of course, uh, age and career progress does not always go hand in hand. So please forgive me if I use the expressions young astronomer and early, early career astronomer interchangeably. Of course, we are all <laughs> young at heart, right? Yeah. <laughs> in my case, my first quarter publication, actually, I just calculated this is from 18 years ago. And I started my first postdoc 12 years ago. So, uh, so well, maybe, maybe I can share a few stories with you after all. That would be great. <laughs> I was also very conscious that I didn't want to talk about my career in a way that I sound boasting or arrogant or condescending. Few things are more repellent to me than that. And I thought that it would be useful to show early career astronomers a balanced view of this profession, both the pros and the cons. But eventually, I personally, I think that despite the hardships, being an astronomer is a very rewarding experience. So maybe I just focus on the more positive things after all. Um, so let's start with, from the very beginning. I, I always wanted to be an astronomer because already, already as a small child, I was absolutely fascinated by the night sky. I grew up in the suburbs of, of Budapest where light pollution was not so bad, especially at that time. And I remember lying in the grass with my parents at summer evenings and stargazing. I was always full of questions uh, about the constellations, about how we can know about a, a, a dot of light, whether it's a planet or a, or a star, how large they are, how far they are. And I clearly remember that I wasn't really satisfied just with the facts. I wanted to understand how scientists know what they know. How do they discover things? So my parents recognized my inquisitive nature and uh, encouraged me to learn mathematics and physics first. So at high school, I went to a class specialized in maths and uh, the university, Otosh Lorand University, I, I enrolled in a physics major with the astronomy specialization. 
After the second year at the university, I applied for a summer internship organized by the International Association for the Exchange of Students for Technical Experience. And I had the opportunity to spend three months in Brazil. So at the age of 20, my uh, very first ever airplane flight was straight to Sao Paulo. <laughs> I worked at the biomedical engineering faculty of the University of Campinas, where I processed ultrasound images. It's funny how interference in ultrasound imaging is an artifact that we want to get rid of, while in astronomy, uh, interference is a very useful tool for astronomical interferometers. So this was back in 2001, and I got home just a few days after the 9-11 terrorist attack. My Brazilian supervisor was at the US at that time, and he was stuck there because his flight was canceled. So I couldn't get some uh, signatures for some documents I needed for the university, but uh, eventually he got home safe and I got home safe, so that's good. But I decided to stay put for a while afterwards. Um, so one year later, after the third year of uh, my university studies, I uh, looked for a student research project and I wanted to uh, do something uh, with infrared astronomy and star formation because these were topics that were scheduled later in the university curriculum. So I had not had learned about these things beforehand. So they all sounded very new and very exotic and interesting for me. I was directed to uh, Peter Abraham at Concoli Observatory who had just returned from the Max Planck Institute at Heidelberg, where he worked on the calibration of ESA's uh, Infrared Space Observatory, ISO. I made this photo of the model of the ISO satellite when I first visited the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg myself. It hung there at the staircase for several years, and I was always happy to see it uh, whenever I visited the Institute, which I have been doing regularly ever since. Uh, I have many, many nice collaborators there. But back to the science topic. So uh, Peter had some uh, data on young eruptive stars. That's where I started working. What are these objects? You may be familiar with this general picture of the formation of sun-like stars. It all starts with the collapse of the densest uh, cores uh, in a giant molecular cloud. And at the beginning, uh, the forming protostar is still embedded in an envelope. Because of the conservation of angular momentum, the material quickly forms a disk that feeds material to the forming star and later becomes the birthplace of planets as well. There's a very interesting phase in this process as the envelope is cleared out when the mass accretion process from the disk onto the star is uh, highly uh, unstable and uh, the accretion rate can vary by several orders of magnitude on very short time scales. These are very spectacular events, but because what we see is basically you look at a young star and suddenly it becomes 100 times brighter. Suddenly means in a few weeks or a few months or sometimes a few years. There are many open questions about this phenomenon. For example, it is still unclear what triggers these uh, accretion outbursts. And we have just started to understand the effects of these on the disk. So I stayed in this field ever since, which I think is a bit uh, unusual. But I moved to other wavelengths. I started with infrared, uh, but I also moved to, to the optical. As a PhD student, for example, I spent a lot of time at our observatory's mountain station. And being young, I was very happy to observe at night, and do the data reduction, and write the paper from my results during the day, and not sleep all that much. Uh, so, for example, during one of uh, one such observing run, I discovered the sudden uh, fading of a young star called V1647 Orionis. This was very unexpected because we thought that this star would, uh, would stay in the bright, high, highly accreting phase for several decades, but then it went back to quiescence. So later it turned out that this object is uh, maybe considered as a, the first uh, example of a new class of young eruptive stars. During my PhD, uh, I took every opportunity to visit uh, different observatories. For example, in 2005, I participated at the NEON Observing School. This is a series of observing schools uh, organized every year. And in 2005, it was in uh, Spain at the Calaralto Observatory. Here I'm standing next to the 2.2 meter telescope. And in the other picture, I climbed up on top of the dome of the three and a half meter telescope. Did you know that uh, telescopes uh, here, uh, the domes are connected to each other with underground tunnels. 
it was a great adventure to discover this and, and of course, to observe the telescopes, to get to know the astronomers working there and, uh, and uh, collaborating with the other students as well. While I visited Calarato only once, I was a regular visitor uh, at Canary Islands. I visited uh, the island of La Palma, uh, and the first image was uh, Roque dels Muchachos uh, Observatory, and I visited several times uh, Tenerife uh, at the Teide Observatory, where we, uh, with my thesis advisor, Peter, we submitted uh, observing time proposals. And whenever we were successful, we always occupied two telescopes, an optical one and an infrared one, so we can monitor the variability of young stars simultaneously at many different wavelengths. Still during my PhD, I uh, had the opportunity to spend half year at Caltech at the Spitzer Science Center as a visiting graduate fellow in, in California and Pasadena. I worked partly on the calibration of IRS, the infrared spectrograph of Spitzer, and partly on science topics involving young eruptive stars and also debris disks. The latter was a new topic for me because uh, debris disks encircle older stars that I had been working on previously. In these systems, the planet formation process is already in a quite advanced stage. And in some cases, it may happen that previously formed planetesimals collide and produce fresh dust in the system, which could be measured very well with Spitzer. Working in the US was a very new experience for me. I had lots of fun there. I even participated at the birthday party of the Spitzer Space Telescope. You can see the a birthday cake here, which says, uh, live long and stay cool. At that time, I took a full advantage of my time in the US to visit exciting places like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or the Owens Valley Radio uh, Observatory. I'm here at the, in front of the 40 meter telescope, but I visited the Karma Array as, as well. I went to Mount Wilson once where uh, I could uh, see the historic 100 inch Hooker telescope and uh, where I could have observed with the Char Array uh, if the weather weren't so humid that water was practically dripping on the side of the domes. Meanwhile, I kept writing proposals also for the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Chile. And one year I was lucky and my proposal was accepted in visitor mode. I could barely believe my eyes when I saw the notification that I won one full night on the UT4 telescope for the 10th of April, 2008, for my birthday, best birthday present ever. Unfortunately, Hungary is not a, an ESO member country, so ESO didn't finance my trip to Chile, but with my thesis advisor, we still managed to go there. I'm uh, here in the control room uh, running my observing scripts. And then when we were flying back from Antofagasta to Santiago, I managed to take a photo of Paranal Observatory from, from the airplane. And in Santiago, we visited the ESO headquarters where I gave a seminar talk. Uh, was a good occasion to, uh, to get to know the ESO community a little bit. Still in 2008, it was a very, very busy year for me, a very exciting event happened. Uh, a young eruptive star called EX Lupi went into outburst. You can see the light curve of this young star here, and you can see how it became uh, suddenly uh, five magnitude uh, brighter in 2008. Uh, this event was discovered by an amateur astronomer uh, called Albert Jones uh, from New Zealand when he was 87 years old. <laughs> the only similar outburst uh, that uh, EXOP displayed happened in uh, 1955, which incidentally was also discovered by Albert Jones. Uh, during this outburst and, and for several years afterwards, we kept in contact with, with Albert and he always sent us his visual brightness estimates of ex Lupi that he made uh, with his self-built telescope. Of course, at that time, we uh, wrote several observing time proposals for uh, lots of different telescopes and instruments, and uh, we published more than 10 papers out of the results of these. But I think the most interesting discovery uh, from these projects uh, uh, was based on the Spitzer spectra of this object. Uh, you see here at the center, the, uh, ten, uh, the a part of the uh, infrared spectrum of ex Lupi around 10 micron. Uh, and you can see that um, what happened is that during the outburst, the spectrum looked uh, very, very different from what it had looked before the outburst. And the difference is due to uh, crystalline silicate grains. These grains used to be amorphous before the outburst, but due to the extra heating during the outburst, these dust grains in the disk were crystallized. 
This was the first occasion that uh, we observed such a real-time formation of crystalline grains in a cosmic environment. And this is very important because uh, silicate crystals are important uh, ingredients if you want to make a comet. And since comets come from the outer cold parts of the solar system, it was a mystery how they can contain material that can only form at high temperatures. Maybe the young sun also experienced outbursts similar to EX Lupi. After finishing my PhD, I got a postdoc position at Leiden Observatory, where I wanted to gain experience in millimeter and radio astronomy. This started a bit slowly because I didn't have such data, and my advisor there, Michael Hockerheide, didn't have such data either. And everyone in Leiden at that time seemed to be very, very busy with the Herschel Far Infrared Satellite. Herschel was launched around that time. The first results were being prepared for publication in special journal issues, but I didn't have Herschel data either. But I kept uh, writing proposals and eventually I succeeded and I could travel to Granada, Spain, uh, to observe with the IRAM 30 meter telescope. I also got data from the IRAM Noima interferometric array for my young eruptive stars. I never visited the array in the French Alps, but I uh, actually have a former PhD student, Orshea Fahir, who now works there as, as a postdoc. Michael Hogerheide also sent me to Hawaii to the Mauna Kea Observatory to observe with the James Clark Maxwell telescope. Of course, I didn't spend there two full years. I only spent there six nights, but that covered New Year's Eve. So if you ever have a chance to visit uh, the JCMT, look at the Observer's Logbook and you will find my mes message wishing everyone a happy 2011. Still in Leiden, we started a summer internship program with the European Space Agency, which is called LEAPS, uh, the Leiden ESA Astrophysics Program for Summer Students. This is a still ongoing program. And at uh, that time, I sup supervised a summer student. And we also organized a trip for the students and for the supervisors to, to go to the Westerbork Syn Synthesis Radio Telescope in the northern uh, part of uh, the Netherlands. And finally, uh, the crown of my radio astronomer career was uh, in 2011 when ALMA started its early science operations. For my last year in Leiden, I worked for the ALMA project as part of Allegro, the, the ALMA local expertise center in the Netherlands. I gave support to potential ALMA users through the help desk, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, read documentation before their release, tested user interfaces. We even made load tests of the server that received the proposals for the first ever ALMA call. The oversubscription at, at that time was crazy, a factor of 11, but my proposal was successful. And so my project was among the first ones observed with ALMA. In this project, we targeted a very special debris disk system called HD21997, which contains not only dust grains, but also um, a lot of carbon monoxide gas, which shouldn't be there at all. Interestingly, the distribution of dust and gas in the system is very different. Uh, we know that uh, some gas may be produced by uh, the collision of icy planetesimals, but in this system, this is not the case. We think that the gas is probably the remnant of the protoplanetary disk, making it a strange hybrid system where the gas is probably still the original, while the dust is freshly produced. And uh, this was again uh, the first such example. Now we know uh, many more uh, such uh, uh, unique systems, interesting systems. In 2011, I won a research fellowship at the European Space Research and Technology Center of ESA, which is located in Nordwijk in the Netherlands. So this was very convenient for me because one Friday I still took my bike to Leiden Observatory, while the next Monday I took uh, the bus to ESA without having to move really. Here, finally, I could get my hands on my own Herschel data and with my supervisor there, Timo Prusti, we studied the cold environments of young eruptive stars and other irregular young stars as well. Here I am uh, with the scaled down model of the Herschel satellite, but I also had a chance to see the real thing in the lab when they did the acoustic tests. During these tests, uh, they exposed the satellite to a very loud noise to see if it could survive the strong vibrations during launch. Well, luckily Herschel survived and the rest is history. I left uh, ESA in 2014, uh, but in 2015, Hungary became member of ESA. I had nothing to do with it, but I'm still very glad of it because it, it gives great opportunities for the Hungarian space research. 
I moved back to Hungary, my home country in 2014 with a fellowship from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, this fellowship program is called Momentum and it was started in 2009 with the aim of attracting outstanding young researchers back to Hungary or halt their emigration. At that time, uh, these were also tenure track positions, which is unfortunately not true anymore. But uh, in my case, it was still true and that's how I, I got my tenure here. Uh, I built my proposal on my alma expertise and in my project, I studied the dynamics of circumstellar disks uh, using mainly alma observations. I focused on three main topics, uh, the eruptive stars and their environment, uh, disk dynamics in numerical simulations, and the disk dispersal and the structure of debris disks. This five-year grant allowed me for the first time to build my own research group, which had, it, had its own challenges. So for example, Concoy Observatory wasn't really prepared for foreign postdocs. So this was the first time that we had to translate contracts and regulations to English. I barely started uh, spending my momentum grant from the academy when I already started thinking about uh, the next thing. Uh, Maria specifically asked me to talk about how I won my grant uh, from the European Research Council. So I collected here my timeline. Uh, I started about three months before, before the deadline because that's when I realized that uh, this is the last year when I still qualify for the starting grant. So I didn't have <laughs> too much time to, to, to prepare my, my proposal, but I managed to finish it by the deadline, which was uh, in November 2015. And um, basically, uh, during the first step, the, uh, not the whole proposal was evaluated, uh, only uh, part B1, which is basically an extended synopsis of my proposal and my CV and track record. Based on this, um, I was invited uh, for an interview uh, in, in March next year. And at that point, I made contact with uh, the national contact point for, for ERC uh, issues, uh, the Academy of uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and they helped um, me for to, to organize the travel for me for an interview training in Amsterdam which was very, very useful. I also uh, exchanged emails and talked to several people who went through such interviews and their experiences certainly had me to prepare for mine. So the interview happened in 2016 May and also in the meanwhile, uh, uh, the evaluation of my full uh, written proposal happened by both the panel members and the external uh, reviewers. And uh, then the final decision happened and I, I got an email message about this, including the evolution summary report in July 2016, after which we started preparing for the grant agreement in, in, the, in the grant I'm uh, put a starting date from the for the project uh, as far in the future as possible, which in that case was the first of July 2017. So if you look at this, uh, it's uh, from drafting ideas to start the project, it, it was almost a two year process. And uh, basically my advice, if you want to try this, is discuss your ideas with as many colleagues as, as are willing to listen, uh, give your application a logical structure, clear structure, and please check the evaluation criteria uh, so that you know what to emphasize and, and what, what aspects to, to try to improve on. So in my project uh, is uh, entitled Structure Decoration Disks, Initial Conditions for Planet Formation in the Time Domain. And in this project, I'm trying to explore the relationship between inhomogeneous disk structure and time variable accretion. My methodology is to combine new uh, multi-wavelength, multi-technique uh, observations with multi-scale time-dependent simulations. With this project, I hope to prove that accretion variability and outbursts are ubiquitous uh, during the formation of sun-like stars. And I uh, want to determine what kind of impact these outbursts and variability in general have uh, uh, on the disk, because I believe that they have a profound impact. And with this, I hope to demonstrate that eruptive phenomenon needs to be incorporated into future models of planet formation. So hopefully with this, I will be able to provide uh, realistic initial conditions for models of planet formation in the time domain and uh, make the foundations on which we can start building the missing links from disks, disks to planets. 
I have to say that not only were my proposals rewarded by uh, research grants or telescope time, but my accomplishments were also rewarded by, by several prizes, as it was mentioned at the beginning, like the Loral UNESCO for Women in Science International Rising Talents Award. Here you can see me at the award ceremony in Paris. And I have to also tell you that uh, most of the prizes I won are, uh, were through self-nomination. So if you see an opportunity uh, where you qualify, I would say, go for it. So basically, this is where uh, I stand now. We arrived to 2020 uh, with its own unique challenges and, and opportunities. I hired three new postdocs at the beginning of this year. And then a few months later, the coronavirus pandemic started. Travel restrictions were introduced and the new colleagues couldn't come as early as we planned. Embassies stopped dealing with visa issues. Flights were repeatedly canceled. It was a big mess. But they're all here now, and I'm very grateful for the new colleagues' flexibility uh, and the observatory's administration for their help. You can see part of the group here uh, in this August when uh, after the first wave, the uh, restrictions were somewhat relaxed, so we could still travel together to the observatory's mountain station. This, this wouldn't be possible right now. There are, of course, other difficulties like work travel is essentially forbidden for us and, and in, also in many other institutes from what I hear. On the plus side, we are just discovering how many great workshops, tutorials and courses are, are available online. So we can still learn a lot even without physically traveling and meeting with the experts. Unfortunately, many conferences were canceled or postponed by one or even two years. Uh, but I think now people are getting more proficient in organizing these events uh, online and, and figuring out the best ways to do this. And in many cases, there are no registration fees or, or it's rather low, which is, I think, a good thing for early career astronomers to, to present their results to larger audiences. Getting new observations is somewhat difficult now. Many observatories are closed or operate in a limited mode. Uh, calls for proposals were canceled. But again, this can be regarded as an opportunity as it gives us more time to analyze and publish data that we already have or do archival studies. And time is very important for all of us. Uh, these were essentially the arguments that I uh, described uh, to the ERC when I requested a one-year extension to my grant, which they very kindly approved. So we don't have uh, more money, but we have more time to spend the money we have and to do what we planned. So we now only have to deal with the day-to-day -day frustrations of home office, not that we should underestimate those. It is sometimes difficult to see or take advantage of, of these opportunities, and I really don't want to force a positive attitude or, or belittle or invalidate the problems uh, that we all face in this uh, horrible situation. My, my talk may give an impression that I had a very straight career path with lots of success, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg for every successful project or proposal, I have at least one or two failed ones. And working on this presentation also made me feel very nostalgic about all the nice observing trips and work visits I could have. Um, so we all know, of course, that being an astronomer is a privilege, but I now realize that it's also something that we shouldn't take for granted. I, I not now know that our world can change very suddenly. It, it did change very suddenly earlier this year. And uh, what bothers me most uh, is that sometimes I feel powerless to, to help my colleagues. I, I know that in this talk, I mostly talked about me and myself and I, but it's, it's, that's not so important anymore. What is important now that I'm responsible for my group members and I want to spare them the hardships I had to go through at their age. And I, I want to give them at least as many opportunities as I got from my own mentors earlier. So this is my constant struggle nowadays. So in the end, I just want to tell everybody not to despair, to try to build up some resilience, try to remain hopeful even in these difficult circumstances. And uh, right now, personally, I feel quite relieved because the deadline for the proposals for the James Webb Space Telescope was yesterday and I collaborated with some very nice, very clever colleagues on, on, on proposals. So I, I, ho I'm, I hope that at least some of this will be successful. And if not, then we'll just keep trying. <laughs> And with that, uh, I stop and take questions. 
Thank you so much for the you very, very, much. very nice presentation and uh, uh, giving you giving us your insight on uh, the hurdle of this career and uh, the pros and cons. You know, it's like uh, having like uh, an equal balance. So. Uh, okay, so if you, we can start asking you a couple of, of questions that we received, like uh, when um, with the registration yeah. form. Um, okay, so. Um, so, yeah, we can start with, uh, there are actually a few questions from the live audience. So there is one that is actually very nice is, uh, how can one carefully transition to different uh, data in terms of wavelength, radio, optical, infrared for one's research? Well, for me, that's that's one of the, the things that I most enjoy in this field. So I, um, I recognized uh, very early on that to, to get a full picture of, of what's happening during star formation, I, I can't uh, constrain myself to one single wavelength because then, then I constrain myself to, to one specific set of physics or just, just a tiny portion of, of, of the full system. So, uh, well, it's, it's just a lot of learning. You have to learn completely different observing techniques, um, get to, I have to get experience with, with new instruments or, or new methods. So it's, uh, but it's that, that's the fun part. I, I like learning new things and, and it, it also gives us opportunity to interact with, with new people, new colleagues from whom you can, you can learn and you can get this experience. Um, so it's, it's one of the most uh, rewarding things in, in, in this profession, I think. And then, of course, I mean, uh, astronomy is very special in a sense that we have all these uh, mostly general purpose instruments that if you have an idea, you can just propose. And, and many telescopes are actually have open skies policy. So uh, even if you or, or your country or your government never put a single cent into building or, or maintaining these observatories, you can still apply and, and get data. So that's, uh, that's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. And in, in that sense also, regarding space missions, how have they been really important for your, for your career and for your field of research? You mentioned, for example, for example working with, uh, with uh, Spitzer. How, are these, how have these played a key role for you? Oh, they are very, very important. So basically for, for star formation, I mean, you can, or, or astronomy in general, you can do a, a optical or near infrared and radio astronomy from the ground. But a wavelength range in between uh, from let's say the mid, uh, mid and far infrared to the highest frequencies of the submillimeter are practically unavailable from the ground or at least the sensitivity and stability we need to study the faintest uh, objects the faintest protostars and their variability is, is practically unavailable from the ground so that's why my career went like uh, from iso through spitzer to herschel and I, i'm currently using wise data for example and now we are all waiting for the uh, james webb and that's why it was actually a big blow recently when isa and jackson announced that they took out the spica mission mm -hmm. as a candidate future that's mission cool. it would have been a great successor of spitzer and herschel so unfortunately i think after uh, gwst uh, we we may have to concentrate again on to the shorter and longer wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, another live question. Uh, as an early career research, what should we keep in mind to write successful proposals for telescope time and also for funding? Well, that, uh, that comes with practice, I think. So just start as early as possible and write as many as you can, um, because that's how you improve. And uh, I think it's very useful if you have colleagues whom, whom you trust or whose opinion you, you trust and then have them read it, have them comment, uh, send you comments and that, that helps a lot. Or if you discuss your ideas with, with colleagues and then and, and you can see, you can check with them whether what you propose makes sense to them. And because if, if, it, if it does, then it will probably make sense also to the panel. So um, yeah. And then again, what I, what I told you with, with the ERC proposal that for, for me is useful if, uh, if you give it a very clear structure, if, if, it's, uh, um, if it's 
uh, understandable easily at, at the first read because I, I've been in, in proposal review committees uh, for different observatories and uh, I have to, you have to know that these these panels have very short time to review very uh, a large number of proposals so they they don't have too much time to spend uh, to understand your proposal so it should be it should be very clear and very understandable so it, it takes some practice and some skills to uh, to develop that uh, that clear uh, writing style Although you're saying that uh, we should write as many as we can, but like, uh, how can we balance actually like between the time of uh, doing like actual research work and publications, because that's what we need and the time that we need to actually <laughs> have publications, because that's very, very tricky. <laughs> Well, that's a tough question. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling with balancing things uh, myself. So I think uh, one way to get experience is that if you don't try to do everything yourself alone. So it's, it's very good if you have a, a, a mentor or an advisor that can already give you some data when you start your PhD or when you start your postdoc, because uh, start coming up with an idea, writing a successful proposal, getting the data, analyzing them and writing a paper, that takes a lot of time. So it's, it's already, it's, it's good if you have already uh, some data to start with and then uh, in, in, this, in your spare time, you can work on, on, on proposals and then you try to collaborate as well with, the, with your fellow students or with your with other colleagues in your institute or, or in other institutes that uh, you, you know they're working on similar topics that, that you are interested in because then, then you can distribute the work, you can lead one uh, and collaborate on, on other proposals where, where you just work on a smaller part or a specific aspect. And then you basically multiply your, your chances. Uh, you also form very nice collaborations. Uh, you, you expand your, your network of, of collaborators this way. And, uh, and uh, yeah, collaborating is fun and then you can learn uh, learn and, and gain experience this way. So related to that, to the fact of uh, being a PhD student and asking for help and by supervision uh, from the supervisor and having data and so on, I'll ask you a question that is related actually to to your supervision experience of students and postdocs. So what makes a good supervisor and uh, how much su support uh, should you provide? And also uh, how can conflicts be managed uh, from the perspective of the supervisor uh, and the supervisee. And the last one, uh, obviously you can reply a global thing, like I'm just giving you like uh, what, uh, what we think it's important to, uh, to have uh, your opinion about. And uh, how can uh, one reflect on themselves as a supervisor with a goal of self-improvement? Okay, so, so what makes a good supervisor? Actually, that's something I'm still learning or trying to figure out and I will probably keep learning it until I retire because uh, basically different people have different needs. So I had a colleague who required minimal mentoring and they just told me that uh, what they are working on every few months and I nodded wisely and then perhaps pointed out some directions that I thought would be interesting to pursue and made them the, the, to travel to conferences. And, and they told me that I've been a great mentor, but I myself felt very bad that I lead them to their own devices. Other colleagues require much more interaction and um, much more frequent consultations. Some I even have to micromanage. It doesn't always work at, out uh, even. So I had students who disappeared on me. So I, I have to accept that I can't really make everyone happy and successful. I, I mostly see my role in a, as someone who provides the best opportunities for them, and, but eventually it's up to them to take advantage of these. And uh, I think, so basically the best, best mentor is someone who can enable their mentees to, to fulfill their potential uh, and who is aware that this potential and the path to reach it is different for everyone. And so uh, I think it's, it's also important to be very open in communications and be approachable and, and also be kind and empathic. 
And uh, that, that comes also for the next question about managing conflicts. So I don't have much, uh, too much personal experience with this. I have never been involved in major conflicts, but minor conflicts do happen or did happen around me. Uh, there were ones with, between a colleague and the management or between myself and the management or, or even between colleagues themselves. And then I think most of this could be traced back to miscommunication. Uh, uh, misunderstandings. So I try to de-escalate these situations by, by patient, polite and well-informed communication and then with lots of empathy. I really just try to imagine myself in their places and, and try to, to understand, try to figure out why they may be upset given the situation and given the information they have uh, or they had at that time. But of course, it's good to be aware what's your institute's uh, policy in handling conflicts uh, or, or who the student's representative or the ombudsperson is, because in most more serious cases, you may need to get in touch with them. And um, on the topic of self-improvement, I mean, I, I don't really know. I, I know we should try to, to improve ourselves. Um, Maybe we should try to learn the method from a book like we did with the basics of astrophysics. And then once we have the tools, we can try to apply them in real life and see what results we get, what works and what does not work. And as we practice more and more, then we will gain more experience. We can try to learn from our own mistakes or learn from others' mistakes. And try and error again. <laughs> and during all that self-improvement, we shouldn't forget about self-care, especially nowadays. Uh, because if you fill up your schedule with telecons from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. with a five-minute lunch break, and if your brain is so keyed up afterwards that you cannot fall asleep until 4 a.m., then you cannot really help your people very efficiently, right? I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> the, touching a bit about the, the pandemic, uh, what do you think would be the main challenges for, for example, for people starting... DOCs or people starting their people starting their careers in the uh, in the post-COVID era, uh, for example, also in terms of I mean being a supervisor. If you look at the future of your PhDs and postdocs, how do you see this affecting? The, well, it's, the, it's difficult to predict this. I mean, I don't have prophetic powers <laughs> to predict this, but from, from my limited experience so far, I mean, what I can say is that I could still hire young researchers uh, this year and people from my group uh, could win fellowships and could leave for new postdoc jobs uh, even this year, two, two of them left. So I'm very happy about that. On the other hand, uh, and especially from the point of view of, of the, the early career researchers, it's certainly more difficult now, I think, uh, to get mentoring due to the compulsory home office. It's more difficult, I think, to develop a research network uh, because or getting the technical experience due to the travel restrictions. And then I, I know that researchers who have teaching duty have these extra difficulties with the, the introduction of online classes. And, uh, and researchers with, who are in home office with small children may experience that in their productivity. I mean, that's a, that's a fact. Um, so I think also in the current circumstances, I heard that it may take longer to finish papers or it may take longer to get referee reports for it. So I think these are all problems that we have to be aware of. I mean, we probably all experienced some aspects of this and uh, it remains to be seen how these issues will be taken into consideration when, uh, when uh, people apply for jobs in the future. And uh, well, we, all, we already experienced uh, an economical recession uh, in general. So the job market may reflect mm -hmm. that in the future. Mm -hmm. And of course we shouldn't forget the, uh, the personal losses due to, due to yes. the virus. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a nice situation. Uh, it's related because it's kind of tricky in the sense that like uh, we are in a moment where we cannot like uh, early career astronomers cannot really advertise their job and so on and it's kind of complicated and we are trying to find new ways to to make this possible uh, but that fits into a broader uh, context of uh, permanent positions and uh, limited number of permanent position and uh, the, the search for the permanent job right so uh, do you think that the current model for the research career progression needs to be changed 
what can we do to 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 change it or something in case uh, you think that it, you know, we need to change it or what's your what's your point of view on it because that's what most of uh, early career um, astronomers struggle with well it's well it's it's hard to change things just just by ourselves and well it's we have to admit that it's a question of money and i firmly believe that more taxpayers money should be invested into research i mean it should be invested into healthcare education and research these these are the most important things because if we don't survive long enough and if if we don't learn about and don't try to understand the world around us then we as a humanity we we as the human civilization will have no future we have no chance hmm. Uh, but that being said, of course, it's, uh, it's important to have a funding system which has several pillars, including both the fundamental research and the applied sciences and interdisciplinary fields. And, uh, and it's, I think it's a positive aspect if people can have uh, more mobility, can pass more readily between the different fields, um, uh, between for example, fundamental uh, science or applied science or, or education and outreach or industry. Um, so I know that there are now resources for, for people who plan to leave academia um, much more than when I was a university mm -hmm. student. So uh, we have to, I think, broaden our, our view of, of, of what opportunities are there for, for researchers or, or, who, or people who have uh, PhDs in, in science. We have one question actually from uh, from the live audience that regards a bit this career path and regarding your personal career path in the uh, in the uh, Hungarian uh, Science Academy. So the, the question reads, uh, I'm wondering how different were the astronomy career standards abroad compared to Hungary and how difficult was it for you to find to fit into careering in the Hungarian Science Academy? Um, so I, I don't think there are many differences. I mean, um, I mean, one difference that is uh, a bit related to the previous question is that when I was a university student, I mean, it was understood that if you are, for example, in a physics major, especially already at the PhD level, then you are there because you wanted to be a researcher. And then when I went to the Netherlands, I, I met people who did uh, an astronomy, astronomy PhD already knowing that they, they don't want to have a career in academia, but they, they do want to, to go into industry. So uh, that, that was, I think, uh, a difference. Um, and maybe this should be much more normal. I, I don't know how what's, what's the case now at, at the university. Um, the academic career, I mean, there, there are slight differences, but I think it's, uh, it has very similar structures uh, throughout Europe and, and, and even, even in other countries as well. So, uh, so the, and that's why I, I think it's, it's quite easy to, to move, move between countries, um, well, which has its cons <laughs> because then uh, we, we, we all know about uh, job insecurity and, and, uh, and that we are forced to, to change countries uh, every few years uh, throughout our postdoc careers. But, uh, but of course, also it's, it's also a good thing for, for experiencing different cultures and, and uh, gaining lots of different ex expertise. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, that is, it's, it's a global community, basically. Mm -hmm. in astronomy. So uh, concerning gaining experience, like uh, um, from the live uh, audience, they're asking, what did you gain from traveling so much and visiting so many telescope sites? Um, so um, basically you learn to use different instruments, uh, which is very useful because uh, if you are there and and you you do everything from you know pointing the telescope to um, fixing the liquid nitrogen when you <laughs> see the telescope so much that it, it spills out, um, you, you just uh, you learn so many things that when you work with the data you you know how that data. Uh, came into existence. <laughs> uh, you don't use the telescope as a black box. You, it's not like you write the script and then out comes the data and then you just blindly believe uh, the numbers. You, you should <laughs> never 
blindly believe uh, what, what's in your computer screen. You, you have to understand uh, the instrumental artifacts uh, to be able to, to, to have confidence to trust uh, what you uh, publish you have to have this understanding and that's uh, for that I think it's very valuable if if you use as many different telescopes and instruments as you you can get your hands on I guess that also helps uh, for writing proposals right Yes, yes, it's it's a, it's similar. So you have to. Uh, it's one difficulty in, in writing a good proposal is that you have to understand the the instrument that you want to use. Otherwise, you may make silly mistakes. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge when you want to use something new. But uh, in astronomy, we are lucky because sometimes when a new uh, instrument comes online, they have a kind of a science demonstration period when people can propose uh, um, projects or objects where we fairly well uh, know what we expect. And then with the new instrument, we can demonstrate that uh, it works well and that it gives what we expect. Uh, and then these uh, observations are typically uh, immediately available for the whole community uh, when, uh, when they're observed. And then everyone can download it uh, and play with it uh, to, to get experience and to, to understand better what the uh, instrument is capable of. So, um, yeah, I think we'll go back to the, uh, there is one last uh, question from the, uh, from the live uh, audience. Uh, the, uh, are there opportunities for working and getting experience with different telescopes as PhD student through summer schools and inter internship? You touched some some of that during yes, your talk. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I mentioned the, the LEAPS. Uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, with which you can go to either ESA or the Laser Observatory. Um, there are the Neon Observing Schools. Uh, there are also, there have been VLTI summer schools where you can uh, learn how to use the uh, VLT interferometer. Um, there are other kinds of uh, summer schools as well. Um, yeah, for example, my uh, master student this year won uh, a possibility for a summer school at Astron to for, for radio astronomy in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, that was cancelled. Uh, I think many of these were cancelled. Uh, I, I think also the IU has a summer school for uh, for students. Um, I think there, there was planned something in, in Mexico mm -hmm. this year. Um, so yeah, just just uh, try to try to explore these possibilities. I mean, I, I may not be aware of, of, of all of them, mm -hmm. and, but there are plenty of opportunities uh, for for getting uh, observational experience. And uh, even if if you are not successful one year, you can try the next year, and and take also advantage of of the astronomical archives. So we have lots of lots of uh, archives for observatories, for for space telescopes, for for, for different instruments. We we have basically the virtual observatory. Uh, you can. You can do a lot of neat things with, with data already available uh, because, uh, because people have sometimes not as much time to publish their projects as they expected. Or, or maybe even you can look at data that people already published, but you have a new idea what to do with the same data, a new aspect, a new point of view that, that you can used to look at the old data. So it's it's very useful. I think there are very few uh, fields of sciences where this is possible. And this is, uh, there's, there's, there's this enormous um, exploration potential in, in astronomy uh, that, that we should all take advantage of. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. The, the data accessibility also is something that is uh, that is wonderful when you have I mean when you can get access, your hands on public data it's always I mean yes. it's something that is becoming more common and that is I mean a chance for us it's not the same in other scientific fields <laughs> yes yes very true um, another live question is uh, how did you manage to align your academic career with your personal life 
Well, it's it's not easy. Um, I've I've always been very competitive, so and, and it's for me it's really really hard to stop working when I, I know I have deadlines or I, I know I have lots of lots of things on my to do list. Um, but it's also something that uh, I enjoy doing. So it's uh, sometimes it's, it feels less uh, as a burden uh, and sometimes more. It depends on, on how tired I am. Um, yeah, but then basically I, I try to set aside times, which is for my family uh, every day, uh, uh, sometime. And, and uh, yeah, I take holidays when, when uh, for a week or two weeks, I, I try to, to forget about science and, and, and concentrate on uh, recharging my batteries. Far away from the Wi-Fi. <laughs> It's very true, yes. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, maybe we'll ask one, uh, one last question about the, well, there is one actually about the uh, DEC, the very specific question. How many years in advance should you consider applying for an ESC starting grant and uh, plan the writing of the applications? Because you have the yearly deadlines, but would you see specific actions that would need to be taken for, I mean, that would be required training courses, supervising students, et cetera, that would increase your chances? Um, well, I don't think these, there are mandatory th things. So there's also, of course, an eligibility criterion, which is for the starting grant is that the, the PI should be between two and seven years since the completion of their PhD. So that's very important. Extensions, of course, are, are possible under certain circumstances, but you don't have to wait until the last moment I, <laughs> like I did. So if you have an outstanding track record and a groundbreaking idea, then, then go for it. And I, I think what we also have to remember is that if, you, if your proposal doesn't get funded, don't despair. Maybe you can reuse parts of it for a different funding scheme. For example, in Hungary, we have a kind of an excellence award for which only those can apply who have uh, recently finished their ERC projects or recently submitted one which met the excellence criterion but did not get funding due to insufficient. Mm -hmm. So in Hungary, you can you can apply for uh, national funding in these cases, and I think it may it may happen in the future that national funding will become more important than ever because uh, unfortunately there are discussions now of the Horizon Europe budget and, and there are plans to reduce the funding for excellent science, including the ERC. So uh, yeah, just just look for for other possibilities as well. So I, uh, do you think you're going to apply for a consolidator grant? I... <laughs> no pressure. Yes, um, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm considering it. But it's, it's kind of difficult to, to um, you know, make this jump uh, mentally because I'm, I'm practically halfway or in, right in the middle of, of my starting grant. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really focused on, on those actions now. So uh, we'll see. Okay, uh, always related to ERC because it, it, it looks like it's a very in field, field topic. Um, uh, what would be, it's from the live audience, what would be considered as a, an outstanding track record for an ERC on your experience? Um, discussion with other people, of course, because you spoke with other people that got it. Yeah, so I, well, I don't, I really don't have numbers in my, uh, in my head now, but uh, basically it's, uh, you can, you can check the evaluation criteria, which is clearly written uh, for the ERC, uh, in the ERC web page, and, and what, so it's, uh, it's, it's not really about numbers, it's it really, I mean, it, it, it's different for all fields of science or even within one field, uh, if, you, if you're working on, on completely different fields. But what they're looking for basically is uh, that the PI has um, the ability to propose groundbreaking research that they can 
show evidence that they have a creative and independent thinking and uh, they have already achievements that uh, typically go beyond the state of the art. And then uh, the last one is that uh, you have to show that you are committed to, to um, the project and you are willing to devote a significant amount of your time to, to this project. So that, that's what they are looking for. So um, yeah, I, at, at that time when I was preparing for this, I, I talked to people who, who recently won the grant and I checked uh, what fields they are working on and how many publications they have. And, uh, and uh, some, some of them worked on fields very similar to mine. So I could judge, I, I looked at their papers and I tried to find this uh, beyond the state of the art aspect um, that I, I also try to achieve in my, in my proposal. So um, yeah, just uh, to check, check what, what others are doing in your specific field, because it's, it's a bit different for, for the different fields, I think. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you very much. Yes. So uh, I have a, I mean, I have a brief announcement to make. So I will have to share the screen. Uh, so I would like to um, to advertise the our. Uh, um, wait, if I. Why is okay? Meanwhile, thank you so much, Agnes, for your time and your talk, and it was brilliant, really, really brilliant. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for me to you made a lot of good points and, and also stuff. getting the questions from the audience. Uh, nice, Kyle. Oh, I think he broke down. Uh, okay, I'll try to take over then. Or am I the one that broke down? Hmm. What happened? Okay. Um. Right, so uh, sorry about we had a technical issue. We wanted to um, advertise uh, our uh, IE photon co contest. So um, it's basically, uh, uh, you can send your own uh, photos uh, uh, that represent your life as a junior member to, uh, to our uh, email address or just put it on Twitter and just tag us and so on. And we have this competition that uh, uh, present the junior members every every week and uh, so on instagram and our social media but at the same time uh, every month we uh, decide to take up on a winner of this photo contest so just send it over and uh, you can already find the winner of october and uh, uh, november online so uh, Please send it over and we are going to show you to our social platform. Um, I'm not sure like uh, what happened if you guys are still hearing me, uh, but in case you are, I'll just take the chance to advertise uh, uh, our next uh, uh, discourse online that is going to happen on Thursday, 3rd of December 2020 uh, at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, sorry mistake 5 p.m uh, um, european time we changed the time from uh, this series on because it's more us friendly so all the people from the us will be able uh, hopefully to join us and uh, it's gonna be a discourse by um Dr. prof chris lintot about publishing without perishing a user uh, a user's guide to astronomical literature. So join us there. And it was very lovely, uh, Agnes, again, to have you here. Thank you to all the attendings. So we're gonna send out uh, our usual form and uh, you can also register for the next events. Bye guys. Thank you, bye-bye, all the bye. best.